All right, let's turn to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament as we continue our studies in order in the Old Testament books. You're going to have a week of rest after this because I'll be going to Dripping Springs down by Austin for a meeting. I've been there several times, and uh, so I'll be gone next Sunday all day and next Wednesday. And uh, Iris is teaching a very wide ladies' day in Austin on Saturday. But when we come back uh, two weeks from tonight, we will take Deuteronomy, in other words, and sum up the first five Old Testament books. And out there in the foyer, uh, you'll find some written material on Joshua and Judges. We're behind in the oral presentation of these, but this gives you an advanced opportunity to read up on what we're going to be studying. And what we do is scope these books and get some of the meat out of them, some of the outstanding points it may even pertain to other matters and in the New Testament and later in the Old Testament. But uh, the book of Numbers is so called because of the numbering of the people that left Egypt headed toward the promised land. And of the men 20 years of age and above, according to chapter 1, verse 46, there were 603,550. That means in all there were about 2 million or more people. But when you think of feeding that multitude and keeping them alive and uh, tending to them in the wilderness wanderings of some 40 years, that was a monumental task. Sometimes when we think of the manna from heaven and the rocks that open up with water and then the quail when they complain they had no meat, uh, you're talking about uh, entourage of lots and lots of people scared to cross the uh, barren land there. And uh, but it's called numbers because of that, and the number of those men, twenty years of age and above, when they left, six hundred and three thousand five hundred and fifty of that number, meaning of the men twenty years and above, only three endured: Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. And Moses didn't enter the promised land. So you're talking about the uh, fallout of lots and lots of people. Now, of course, there were women and children and others not of that age bracket. But uh, that's a very interesting thing. But there's another point that I believe that we need to notice. It made a difference whether God counted the people or when people got a little brash and wanted to count themselves for uh, braggadocio purposes. I want to give you several references where the Lord made it clear that numbers mean very little. Truth is what counts. You might remember in Exodus 23, 2, do not follow a multitude to do evil. The magic formula for some religious groups is uh, 50 million people couldn't be wrong. Well, 50 billion could be wrong. Truth doesn't reside in the majority or the minority. Truth is truth if no one believes it or if everybody believes it. And it's truth that's important. Strong in the land, but not for truth, Jeremiah cried in Jeremiah 9, 3. Or they were thick, they were numerous, but they were worthless. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, Few there be that find it, speaking of eternal bliss. And many go in there at the way to perdition. And then in 2 Samuel, this is very important, 2 Samuel 24, 1 and 1 Chronicles chapter 21, the people were rebuked sternly by God for numbering the people for bragging purposes. So when we study the book of Numbers, we ought to think about that. In Acts 2.47, we read, The Lord added to the church such as were being saved. So if the Lord does the addition and the numbering, that's one thing. But if men think strength resides in numbers instead of truth, uh, they need to reread the Bible. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 and 7, Paul reminded the carnal, shallow Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. And a lot of people fail to understand how important that is. In Revelation 3, 1 to 5, the Lord also said he would blot out some names he had entered in the Lamb's Book of Life. He not only adds to, he takes from. He is the one that understands where people belong. And thus the real question is, my, is my name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Sad, was it once there and isn't anymore? So when you even 
think of the word numbers, uh, these things ought to come to mind. Now, I want to say one little brief thing aside here, and I'm just as serious. The fellow said, I'm as serious as a heart attack, and that's pretty serious. I had rather work with 10 faithful brethren meeting in a rented hall on a back street who loved the truth than with a thousand who went along for the ride or for showmanship. The best church I ever worked with in 51 or two years of regular preaching was one of the smallest I ever worked with. 27 members in Nina, Wisconsin, meeting in a rented hall. Everybody came every time the doors opened. When we had a gospel meeting, we had 65 people crammed in that little old place. Children sitting at, on the windowsills, packed in there. If every congregation had that uh, ratio when they had a gospel meeting of three times the membership, wouldn't that be something instead of one-third of the members showing up? I've been asked, is it a little disheartening working with a smaller congregation as you are now? No. I believe some of the most solid, faithful, loyal, devoted Christians I've ever been with are right here in this place. I mean that. Oh, there's some that don't come on Wednesday night and some don't on Sunday night, but for the most part, well, like Sunday, we had 58 that morning, 59 that night. And we had about three families that were gone. Maybe more than that, but three that usually are here and would be here if they were in town. The point I'm making is faithfulness is what counts. That's where real strength is. And when you think of the work that we're able to do when we stick together and work away from home and so forth, I, I'm real encouraged. I think that we have a reason to be encouraged. It's real interesting, too, when you think of Joshua and Caleb. In uh, chapter 14, verse 24 and 1438, these two great unsung heroes are mentioned. Only two out of 12 that went into look over the land of Canaan to bring back a report. And in Moses' mind, that wasn't necessary because when God said, I'll give you the land, he'd keep his word. But they went in and stayed some 40 days and came back and 10 of the 12 said, it's just what God said, a land flowing milk and honey. It is abundant. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It's great, but we can't take it because there are giants in the land and we're grasshoppers in their sight. Joshua and Caleb said, we're well able to rise up at once and take the land. Let us go hence. Let's go forth. But they didn't listen to the two faithful ones. Be hard to beat two men that have the valor and courage to stand up. And the people let not only listen to these sorry ones, they said, let's make us a captain to lead us back to Egypt. They were so faithless, they wanted to go back to a land of bondage from which God had delivered them because they missed all the special food and other things there and didn't have the menu they wanted out in the wilderness. And instead of counting their blessings, they murmured and complained. I want to give you a reference for you to read on your own. Hebrews chapter 3, begin with verse 12. that says, Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and depart from the living God. And he discusses the people Moses led in the wilderness toward the promised land. And he said they entered not in because of unbelief. But you know what's in between verse 12 and verse 19? He tells why they didn't enter in. They murmured and complained. Instead of praising and thanking God, they murmured and complained. Do you know how Hebrews 4 begins? It wasn't divided into chapter and verses by the Lord. <coughs> Let us therefore fear, after a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of us should seem to come short of it, for they uh, enter not in because of unbelief. And so we need to be warned lest we have an evil heart of unbelief. And that's the underwriting reason the Hebrews was written. The sin of unbelief. The sin that did so easily beset them. Not you have a besetting sin and I have a besetting sin. There was one sin common to all of them. The sin of unbelief. And when you don't really believe in God, you don't thank God. You don't praise God. You murmur and complain against God. And that's one of the overriding lessons that we learn. I'll tell you another very, very interesting uh, chapter is Numbers chapter 6 and you need to really listen to this if you haven't studied this before the Nazarite vow not Nazareth vow not uh, Nazarene vow Nazarite vow in fact the correct spelling of that is probably N-A-Z-I-R-I-T-E but that was a vow that was taken that simply meant we will live closer to God 
we will make our life count for God. Many people believe that was the vow that Paul took in Acts chapter 21. that has been such a puzzle to people, and how could he take that vow and go into the temple and even pay for other Hebrews that had made that vow after Christianity had already begun? Well, first of all, there was a civil part to Israel as well as a spiritual part. Israel was God's nation as well as his spiritual people. And Paul was following, you might say, a custom or tradition in the civil part of his background. And if the Nazarite vow was, as many believe, and as number six would indicate, where a man said, I'll live nearer to God, Paul could say that. He might mean something different than others may mean by that. But the whole point is, if you read Acts 21 carefully, no one can use that today because no Gentile was under that. That's in Acts 21. So anyone that says I accommodate denominationalism because of Paul's vow, in Acts 21 I can compromise like he did, they're off on the wrong tangent there. But the Nazarite vow, which could be taken for a certain period of time or for a lifetime, as Samson and John the Mercer were lifetime Nazarites, or it could be taken for a week or ten days or whatever brief time Paul and those in Acts 21 took it. But this is another point that's important. Whatever Paul's intention was, it didn't work. It backfired on him. Because the Jews who hated him already for leaving Judaism and becoming a Christian accused him of something he didn't do, of taking a Gentile into the court of the Jews. He was trying to accommodate them so he could reach them, and it backfired because of their prejudicial bigotry toward him. So anyone who tries to make anything out of Acts 21 forgets in that very chapter says this is not for Gentiles. And it didn't work anyway. Then there's a third point that I quickly add, and some people just break out in a rash when I say this. The Bible didn't say Paul was perfect. I know only one perfect person the Bible holds up, and that's Jesus Christ. Paul could have made a mistake in judgment. That's like saying, well, do you know what Abraham and Sarah laughed? Well, number one, I haven't read where laughing is such a terrible sin. And number two, no one said Abraham and Sarah were perfect in the first place. We need to understand the Bible just records things as they are, as they were, as they happened. Doesn't mean it approves everything. For instance, the Bible quotes some things the devil said. Does that mean that God approved of Satan? Just telling a fact. We've got to understand as we study the Bible to handle it right. And then in number 6, verses 24 to 26, we have Aaron's prayer or exclamation, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and give thee peace. It's one of the most beautiful uh, uh, phraseologies in the entire Old Testament has been made into a, sort of a benediction, a song that people think is especially beautiful. In uh, chapter 11, verse 16, and I want you to really write this down, and with 11.16, put Exodus 16. Could it be that this is the beginning of the Sanhedrin concept? The Jewish Sanhedrin was composed of 71 members. 70 plus the one who presided. You read of the Sanhedrin all over the New Testament, Nicodemus and others, uh, John chapter 3. It was a court of the Jews that helped decide judicial matters matters of judgment and so forth that pertain directly and indirectly to the Jewish uh, people. But uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law in chapter 16 of Exodus said, I've noticed, Moses, that you decide on every single matter and you're so busy you're worn out. Couldn't you appoint some men to help you? Could it be that this, since the number was 70 and here in 1116, could it be that that was the beginning background of where the Sanhedrin came from way back in Moses' day? I think that's an interesting thing to think about. In chapter 13, verse 33, this is after the men have been in the land for 12, uh, 12 men been there for 40 days, and they come back to make a report, and it's a pessimistic report. Uh, there are giants in the land, were grasshoppers in their sight, and the wording because we were little in our own eyes, so we were in their eyes. 
See, the way you view yourself, pessimistically or optimistically, makes a lot of difference. If you think you're worthless, you probably aren't as worth as much as you could have been. I think of a fellow who came to college from Rhodesia. He was already about 30 years old when he came. If you think I'm homely, I really was pretty upside of him. And when he smiled, he had snaggle to him. He is already bald-headed. Kind of bent over like this, but I don't believe I ever met a more optimistic Christian in my life. And his job out there was to take care of the president's yard and flowers and garden. And he was a meticulous worker. I don't believe there was a weed for four years in that flower bed, in that garden. Never saw a guy like that. The only problem I ever had with him was he wanted to room with me one summer when I was there for half the summer. And I loved him a lot, but he... He said, let's pray, and he meant half the night. I mean, I, I know it kind of got embarrassing. I snored about halfway through his year, year and a half, I mean, hour and a half prayer. But, but anyway, every time I heard him speak, and he wasn't a real good speaker, but he loved the Lord. And I still see him standing there. He said, praise God, I'm not much, but I'm the child of a king. And he meant that too. When he died, after he went back over there, I wrote an article in the bulletin that later appeared in some of the papers, The Child of a King, and I talked about him. Uh, most optimistic fellow with less reason to be optimistic, but because he's a Christian. Well, the thing is so interesting, because we were little in our old eyes, so we were in their eyes, but in Joshua chapter 2, when they get to the promised land, they find that the people in the promised land were afraid of them. See what pessimism does? It's really an interesting thing. To be cocky and arrogant is one thing. On the other hand, to be pessimistic is another thing. We're to be optimistic. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13 I owe a debt of gratitude to my dad who grew up in kind of sad circumstances. His own dad died when my dad was six years old. My dad was the oldest child of three in the family. He had to go out in the field and do a man's work by the time he was about eight years old. And he didn't get to go through... Uh, many grades in school and all, but he studied his dictionary and his Bible and read the newspaper and had a better vocabulary than his three children who went through college. But he had an optimistic attitude. If anybody can do it, I can do it. And when he died, he owned a big publishing company in Abilene, and he could crawl up on those big machines that were a block long and fix whatever broke down. He just figured out some way. One time when I was about 15, he jumped out of bed about midnight, went in where there was about the only good light we had and started writing and diagramming something, and he invented a coat hanger machine uh, he, while he was about half asleep, you know. And it worked. And that's back when you didn't have many coat hangers, and they were priceless almost. And he and my brother could operate that thing. And they made some money back when it was hard to make money. And only problem was about two years later it broke down and he didn't have another dream on how to fix it. And he, he took it down to the foundry and Sherman and they couldn't figure it out either. But the point is, his idea was if anybody can do it, I can do it. And it wasn't because he had a great background of optimism. And I admired him for that. But I've seen too many members of the church that are always dragging around and moaning and groaning about how useless they are. They get up and go to work and put their trust in God, they could accomplish a lot more. And so they go in circles in the wilderness of sin for 40 years. One year for each day they were in the land because they were faithless. And in 14.4 they said, let's make us a captain to lead us back to Egypt. And I've often said it before, when you first want a captain, it won't be longer to ask for a king. And in 1 Samuel 8, that's just what they did. Give us a king that we may be like the nations round about us. And so in verse 11 of chapter 14, how long will I put up with this disobedient people? God is distraught over the lack of confidence in him. And they want earthly leadership, and God allows it. He gave them a king in his anger, took him away in his wrath, Hosea 13, 11. He granted their request, but sent leanness into their soul, Psalm 106, verse 15. So we better watch what we ask for. We might just get it and be in a lot of trouble. But you know, that is the way sin progresses. Let's make us a captain to lead us back to Egypt. Then they want a king. And today we have people in the church that have the attitude, I think, of let's be like a nation drowned about us. Let's be like denominationalism. 
It's amazing to me how people are not content with just the old Jerusalem gospel. What's wrong with the gospel of Christ? It's God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. We don't need any embellishment. When wheat checks, the cereal first came out about 30 years ago, I wrote an article based on something that's on the side of the box. No gimmicks, they said. No gimmicks. We don't have any toys or whistles or balloons in here, just cereal. I wrote an article. We don't need any gimmicks in New Testament Christianity either. But about that time, brethren started bringing entertainment in. And it's amazing how fast that grew and how pretty soon we were aping denominationalism. We had a message they didn't have. We had a purpose they didn't conceive of. But we gave it all up to be like the nation around about us. That's one of the biggest problems that I think we face today. In chapter 15, and I want you to write this down and put with it Psalm 19, 13, which says, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let us not be guilty of the great transgression. I believe he's talking about the great transgression, the sin of Adam and Eve, which had to do with presumption. God said, here's the way it is. They presumed he didn't mean it. They listened to Satan. They presumed he was right. They were wrong on both counts. God was right and he was wrong, and they reversed it and followed Satan's advice and turned their back upon God. That's presumptuous sin, when you sin on purpose, when you sin knowing better. And throughout the Bible, it's referred to as high-handed sin. Sin you commit on purpose. Presumptuous sin. You project yourself into the matter and push God out. Well, what's he talking about in that chapter? This is interesting. Seventh-day Adventists ought to read this chapter. He's talking about people that pick up sticks on the Sabbath day, which is a violation of the Sabbath law. You remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, Bethany was a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem. You know what a Sabbath day journey was? Seven eighths of a mile. Any Adventist who claims to worship on the Sabbath day because of Exodus chapter 20 ought never on Saturday to go beyond seven eighths of a mile. I went to one of their buildings in Appleton, Wisconsin years ago. And uh, on the front steps, I met with some of them. I found out one fellow had come all the way from Green Bay, 40 miles. I said, you violated the Sabbath. You're here as a seven-day Adventist, and you broke it the minute you got in your car and came down here 40 miles. You can only go seven eighths of a mile. And I said, back in Old Testament days, which you claim you're under, you'd be stoned to death for presumptuous sin. His eyes got real big. And I said, you probably slopped the pigs and fed the chickens and milked the cow too, didn't you? Somebody need to tell him that. Someone says, that sure is very exacting. We'll read Exodus 16, verse 29. In essence, it says, stay home. So anyone who thinks that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath has a pretty serious problem. And denominational preachers who say we're under the Ten Commandments today and worship on Sunday ought to be ashamed for being so dense. The Sabbath day was never the first day of the week. But on the other hand, I have some brethren that try to make Sunday the Christian Sabbath, because they tell me I can't mow my yard on Sunday. That a Christian woman can't wash her iron on Sunday. Where'd they get that? Now, I shouldn't forsake the assembly anytime. But the very idea of trying to bind upon Christians today concepts that never did go with the first day of the week. And that goes back to that uh, Sunday religion. I grew up having people say, you have your Sunday clothes? You can't go to the picture show on Sunday. Well, we shouldn't go any day anymore. But it's amazing to me how we have a Sunday go-to-meeting religion based upon a misuse of the Sabbath day concept of Exodus 20, which was given not to a single Gentile to ever live, but to those who let out of Egypt out of the house of bondage. But I guarantee if we're still under that system, uh, we better not do anything that even begins to compare with picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. I'm sure glad we're not under that system. In chapters 18 and 19, well, let's, let's get 17 first. That does come between 16 and 18. Aaron's rod that budded, very important. It shows that God selected Aaron and his family as the high priest of the Levitical priesthood system. 
and the tribe of Levi as the tribe that produced the priests. And special provisions were made for them. Did you know today Christians are in the royal priesthood? And every single Christian is a priest and Christ is the one and only high priest? Some of my brethren don't know that. The preacher didn't come visit me when I was sick. Well, you mean he's a high priest and you're just a priest? If the preacher isn't the first one there when a baby is born or the first one there when somebody dies, if he doesn't hold our hand while we have a runny nose or the pink eye, uh, he's a bad hombre. And we have arranged a system where we parallel a gospel preacher with a denominational pastor. Nowhere is that found in the Bible. Am I suggesting those of us who preach should never visit it? Not because I'm a preacher. I've never visited anybody because I'm a preacher. I should because I'm a Christian. But I can't visit everybody like you can't visit everybody. I need to find out where I'm needed the most, just like you do. But we have a concept that is totally anti-biblical that is professionalism gone to seed. A lot of people have no more idea or notion of what the work of a gospel preacher is in that wall there does. And too many preachers accommodate the pastoral professionalism that brethren try to force on us. We really need to think about that. But Aaron's rod that budded simply showed that God selected Aaron and his family for the priests, or the high priests, uh, in uh, one at a time, of course, in Judaism. In Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9, we learn that Christ is the one and only high priest in Christianity, and he offered himself as the once for all time sacrifice for sin. Because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, Hebrews 10, 4. But this man, Christ, after he made one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. These are really interesting points that add uh, a lot of light to New Testament teaching. In chapters 18 and 19, we learn that only the best gifts of whatever we offer to God will he receive. He won't take an old sick, lame, blind animal. Even when they offered animal sacrifices, he wanted the best. In the book of Malachi, at the end of Old Testament history, 400 years before Christ, as the Old Testament closes, they were offering God old sick animals. And he said, if you think that's acceptable to God, give it to the governor of Persia. See what he thinks about it. Give it to the governor. Give him these old sick, beat up animals. If you think that'll please God. They wouldn't do that, though, to an earthly ruler. But chapter 20 of Numbers is the blockbuster chapter, the sin of Moses that kept him out of the promised land. I was out mowing my yard in Carson County years ago. We lived there five years. And Miss Monford, who lived next door, we'd been trying to teach her, and she'd listen to us on the radio and read some things we had in the paper. And right in the middle of my lawn mowing, I was very glad someone stopped me. But anyway... She said, I went to see uh, the Ten Commandments last night, and I just want to know what Moses did that was so bad that kept you out of the promised land. I said, thank you, Helen, for asking me that question. I've been trying to teach you the principle uh, ever since we've known one another. He didn't do what God told him to do. And when God tells you to do something, you can't add to that what you want to. I said, that applies to the Lord's Supper, the elements of it to the necessity of baptism, to why we don't use instrumental music and worship. He didn't do what God told him to do. And in Numbers chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 31, I think this is very, very interesting. Uh, we have uh, 32, 51. That's 20, Numbers 20, verse 12, and Deuteronomy 32, 51. In one place it's called the sin of unbelief, and the other, the sin of disobedience. For unbelief, equates with disobedience. And so what he did there showed unbelief, lack of faith and trust in God, and it was a matter of disobedience. Have you ever noticed in chapter 21, verse 16, exactly what it was that Moses did that was so presumptuous? He said, I will give you water. So he took it upon himself 
And the thing that made it so strange is he's one of the meekest men who ever lived, one of the greatest servants God ever had. But he allowed the people to aggravate him to the extent that he sinned. That was presumptuousness on his part. Deuteronomy 32, or Numbers 32, 23, he said, be sure your sin will find you out. I never shall forget preaching on Moses, the good points and the bad points and so forth. And a fellow came out and he was kind of in a huff. He was a little aggravated. He said, you didn't mention one thing on what was Moses' problem. And I said, well, I couldn't mention everything. He said, I want to tell you a verse. You go look up. And he did me a favor. I never would have thought of it. He said, that tells you what was wrong with him. And that's Psalm 106, verse 32 and 33. Moses spake in advisedly with his lips. Psalm 106, verse 32 and 33. So he allowed them to push him in to an aggravation that he said and did things he shouldn't have done, even though for the most part he's one of the greatest men who ever lived. And we do greatly err if we don't understand what a great man he was. If you keep reading and read on to Deuteronomy, just before it says, Moses, my servant, is dead, you know how he spent his last days? Magnanimously preparing Joshua to lead the people he couldn't lead into the promised land. One of the great men of all time. No question about it. Did he err exceedingly? Yes, he did. It ought to tell us what can happen when we allow other people to press us to where we speak in advisor with our lips and take upon ourselves the grandeur and splendor that belongs only to God. It also shows us that God means what he says and says what he means. There's very little anything, even a 30-second cousin of what some would call double talk, in fact, 1 Peter 2 says of Christ, never was any guile found in his mouth. You know what that means? It's an agricultural term. He spoke of a man bringing his wheat to sell and have the best wheat at the top and the best at the bottom and right in the middle packed away from where they could punch and say would be chaff and impurities and heavy weight. But with Jesus from the top to the bottom, you could put that stick down there anywhere and he never ever sinned. Never was any guy found in his mouth. He always said what he meant, meant what he said. And here's one of the few occasions in the life of Moses that he was anything other than valiant and courageous and loyal and true. It ought to teach us that we need to be careful lest we let others press us into something that is unseemly before God. Chapter 21 is more important than we have made it because Jesus refers to it in John 3 in his discussion with Nicodemus, the brazen serpent. I think this is real interesting. Because of their lack of appreciation, their murmuring and complaining, they're in the wilderness. They were bitten by snakes and they were dying. God told Moses to erect a brazen serpent and those who looked to that in faith, trusting God, would be spared. And Jesus uses that in John 3, 14 and Nicodemus to show him that trust in God means you obey God. But I'll tell you what's interesting. In 2 Kings 18, when Hezekiah was destroying all the idolatry that had been magnified and caused the people to turn away from God, he found that brazen serpent and they were using it now as a relic of idolatry. What God had commanded to be erected by a servant for a good purpose, they were now using for a vain, ungodly purpose. You remember that strange word in Second Kings 18? Nahushtan. N-E-H-U-S-T-A-N. It's only a piece of brass. See, when God says erect it for a purpose of obedience and saving, even in the temporal realm, that's one thing. But when men keep it as a relic of idolatry and begin to worship it, Destroyed, he said, Nahushtan, it's only a piece of brass. Colossians 3, 5 says, covetousness is idolatry. Let me make an application. It takes money to spread the gospel. We're commanded to give upon the first day of the week and to give generously. And yet Colossians 3, 5 says, covetousness is idolatry. The very thing we ought to be giving to God can become an idol. And the reason a lot of people don't give near what they ought to on the first day of the week is they idolize what mammon can purchase and buy and give them comfort and refinement and esteem in the eyes of others. If we're not careful, we could use the very things that God ordained for a godly purpose 
for an ungodly purpose. Now, to show you how this is carried over in another passage of Paul's, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12, he mentioned that 23,000 people of God perished on one occasion. He's going back to Numbers, chapters 21 and following. He's talking about these people. He said, now let you take heed lest you fall. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So we can actually use against God the very thing he provided for our enrichment and betterment. Chapter 22 introduces to one of the rare characters of the Bible, Balaam. In Jude verse 11, we read, Woe unto them who have gone in the way of Cain, that perished in the gainsaying of Korah, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Back in chapter 16, we read of Korah and the rebellion of 250 others against Moses and God's constituted authority in him. And the ground opened up and swallowed them alive. Now he talks about another one of those mentioned in Jude 11, Balaam. In 2 Peter 2, 15 and 16, I want to read to you something that is probably one of the rarest of all New Testament passages from the Old Testament setting. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Boshar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Yes, the donkey that exhorted a man. So here's a fellow who loved the wages of unrighteousness. In 23.10, though, he said, let me die the death of the righteous. But you can't do that if you live unrighteously as he did. But the most important thing to ever remember about Balaam, someone says, how do you have a right to say that's the most important? Because in the New Testament, we read of the doctrine of Balaam. And in Numbers 31.16, we learn of the doctrine of Balaam. It was the teaching of Balaam. He could not pronounce a curse upon God's people. Jehovah wouldn't let him. But he devised a way to get God to place a curse upon them. To get Israel to sin. In idolatry and adultery, which was joined together. In the worship of a pagan deity, where immorality was practiced in the process of that worship. It was the doctrine of Balaam that caused the people of God to err. And... In two of the seven congregations mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the doctrine of Balaam held sway. So these people that he could not place a curse upon himself were cursed by God because they disobeyed God and obeyed evil and cooperated with immorality. Many times pagan deities go with uh, uh, immorality or you worship in error and then that brings about living in error. In chapter 23, 19, we have the famous statement, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And I still believe today one of the biggest problems we face is making God in man's image. The Bible says man's made in God's image, but about from the time he created man, men have been trying to make God in their image. In Psalm 50, 21, Jehovah said, Thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove them and set them in order before thine eyes. So he is not a man that he should lie. I believe one of the most interesting verses and controversial in the sense that some believe it refers to Christ and some say no is Numbers 24, 17. For sheer beauty, I choose this, the most beautiful verse in the book of Numbers. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. There are those who believe that at least is an indirect reference to Christ. But I, won't, I know one thing, for sheer beauty, that's one of the prettiest verses in all the book. Then put down 32.6. Is it right for you to sit idle while your brethren have gone out to war? And then underline again 32.23, be sure your sin will find you out. In other words, we do reap what we sow. And the last point that I want to make, well, I hear a little tapping on the door. Sometimes I wish I was deep as well as dumb, as they used to say. 3355, I've been asked all my life, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? And I've read all the uh, 
statements that brethren have made. Most popular idea was bad eyesight because he said, see with what large letters I've written this unto you, Galatians. And he said, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. But it could be that the thorn in the flesh doesn't mean any physical malady. For in 33.55, he speaks of people being perplexed as a thorn in your side. You ought to read that passage and think about it. All right, two weeks from tonight, the book of Deuteronomy. What did I do this time? Yeah. Isn't that something my wife and granddaughter sitting here laughing? <laughs> <laughs>